This is Always Subject to Change, and I'm visual artist Anne Hamilton. Hi, and I'm Johanna Burton. I'm the director of the Wexner Center for the Arts here in Columbus, Ohio. Um, today, we're very excited to be joined by Dr. Mark Lomax II. Mark is a longtime friend and collaborator with the Wex, and actually a newer but also important friend of, of mine since I arrived, and we may talk about that a little bit today. Based here in Columbus, Mark is an acclaimed and extraordinarily accomplished musician, composer, activist, and educator. The Wexner was honored to support the completion of his remarkable 400, an African epic, a 12 album project focused on the story of Black America from the 400 years of the start of the slave trade to the current moment, and combined not just the music, but a curriculum about the African diaspora. This ambitious work is a stunning example and but one of many of how Mark blends collaboration, history, and the spiritual and political aspects of African-American art in his work. I'm eager to talk with Mark today, not just about his work, but the work of the artists um, and, and his, himself in our present day, the responsiveness, the engagement, and the questions we can use art to not just ask, but to use as a tool to hold us accountable. Can think of no better person to, t uh, to speak to around these topics, Mark, so thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Johanna and Anne. It's a pleasure. So the way we like to kick this off really is we kind of want to hear what you're thinking about. I mean, I, right before this call, spent some more time um, looking at the documentary, um, which we can talk about today, and thinking how, how little has changed and how much has changed since I met you and, and you were working on those, um, on those different elements of that project. Maybe we can start there um, and jump right in. Do you want to say a little bit to orient folks on, on this um, you know, who, who haven't seen or been part of uh, 400 to, to what I'm speaking about? Yeah, thank you. Um, 400 African Epic is a 12 album, eight and a half hour musical cycle with seven different ensembles. There's a curriculum and a documentary um, that tells the story from pre-colonial African history through the Ma'afa, which is 1619 to 2019, which is when the project was released through 400 years into the future. Um, the, the, it, I started writing it in 2016 because um, I had just started a new job and I felt like I had not been productive as an artist. And w there's nothing better to do than to go from a lack of productivity to like stupid productivity. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it really just w was something that resonated in my consciousness um, three years until the quad centennial of the first Africans, 20 and odd Negroes, as they were called, um, being forcibly brought to North America as enslaved Africans. Um, the slave trade had been happening in South America and the Caribbean for about 100 years or so uh, prior to that. Um, but it was the first time officially on record that uh, those 20 Angolans came or brought to North America as, as slaves. and. Um, you know, to your point about a lot having changed and a lot having not changed, um, I felt like as a composer and in Columbus, the Central Ohio region, one, I think I'm the only African American composer with a doctorate degree in the region. Um, and we don't, in our culture, in, in America and in the West, really hear uh, music or art about these stories in that really expansive way. You know, because there's just not a lot of funding. There, there aren't very many opportunities for us to tell our stories. And I had gone through a pro process where I was, I love Kronos Quartet. And I'm like, that's a cool name. Where did that name come from, right? And I'm looking and it's Greco-Roman, uh, or Roman Greco, Greco-Roman mythology, right? Uh, the Orpheus uh, uh, Chamber Orchestra, you know, all these really cool names, you know, from these groups uh, that are European or Eurocentric ensembles that get, you know, their whole ethos from that history. Where were the groups or, or even the um, projects focused on African or, or African-American or diasporic, you know, history and narratives? And, and you don't really see it. And so um, I had a good job at the Columbus Foundation. I wasn't really worried about whether or not I could sell a CD. Uh, so I began the process of um, doing this crazy work. And I didn't think it was going to be 12 hours of music, uh, 12 albums of music. I thought it was going to be a symphony. Um, but as I started to sketch, it just felt like each section of the symphony was a chapter in a book. 
and the 12 albums represent 12 chapters in this you know epic narrative um, that says we were once fully wholly human and then we went through this 400 year process where we weren't and not because we were born less than but because legally we were socialized to be less than ourselves and um, it's now time for us to reclaim what is ours and that is our humanity and by doing that we actually help the world reclaim its humanity which i think you know for later in the conversation is really one of the most significant roles of the artists and the art that we create um, Mark, relative to that, I've been thinking a lot as I was um, re-listening to that, to what's online and looking at the documentary and also remembering being at the Lincoln Theater. And I feel like, oh, I'm still vibrating <laughs> from that really extraordinary event. And your, uh, which is, I think when it premiered here in Columbus, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it, I was thinking relative to that a lot about uh, bodily memory and cultural memory and how rhythms work in us and and how partly where your rhythms come from that invite us in um, and I think sometimes um, there are things that exist in the culture and certainly this epic piece references a lot of different um, music forms and styles but um, I think there's also a part where there's a rhythm working in you that's like a memory you didn't know you had. It's like deeper than a, like a cultural memory, mm -hmm. like it's molecular or cellular. Um, can you talk about that relative to how you approach compose composition and think about music? Yeah, thank you. I, I call it ancestral memory. Yeah. Um, and to your point about rhythm, so as I've studied why Black America really is in the place that it is, um, from a psychological perspective, uh, from the concepts of internalized oppression and so, um, surplus powerlessness, and why white America is where it is, and then everything in between, right? Those polars, those poles, so to speak. Um, I've come to learn that the institution of slavery really negatively impacted all of us and exists currently in, in a way that's really invisible unless you can see the actual code of the matrix, so to speak, right? And, and part of that is rhythm, man. Um, in, in a lot of ways, when we were forcibly torn from our homes on the continent of Africa, we started to get tuned to a different rhythm, right? Western military march rhythm, the duple meter, is the rhythm of the West period, right? All of the music, even in triple time, uh, three, four, like Amazing Grace is in three, four time, um, still comes from that very strict rhythmic construct of military rhythm, march rhythms. Whereas African meter is at the triple, but it has a lilt that is not metronomic, right? Nobody's marching, you are dancing, but the dance is fluid. Right, And so our rhythmic programming shifted from this fluid, fluid, complex rhythmic structure to this relatively simplistic, very static and stoic structure, which means we're not accessing a part of ourselves because we're vibrating at a suboptimal frequency, right? And so what, from, from I've been playing drums since I was two and I always got in trouble <laughs> in the bands that I started playing in when I was six in church because I always had this natural affinity for rhythms that nobody else really found in the music that we were playing. <laughs> and either it was because I was imposing it because I heard it or it was so natural I could not play it. I've never been that disciplined a, a person where if it felt all organic and authentic, I denied it. You know, that's just not as an artist who I've been. And so as a result, I got fired from a lot of bands and I got fired from a lot of churches but um, in my own compositional aesthetic, I've tried to honor that and, and bring that in both as kind of a reflection of that ancestral rhythmic memory, but also as a way to bring a lot of what most composers would, would think is disparate material together. So at the Lincoln, on, in that premiere, um, January 2019, you saw a European string quartet with an African-American jazz quartet in terms of where we think those musics came from, right? Classical music actually is a derivative of African music uh, that was brought to Europe by the Moors in 711 
uh, B, uh, CE, right? So that's when all of that education and, and the evolution of what would become Western classical music came from. So it's all African music as far as I'm concerned. But putting those two ensembles together and writing for them in a way that the music would not be complete without one of those ensembles is a metaphor for how we should exist as humanity, in, in my opinion, as human beings. And, and it means that that duple rhythm and that triple rhythm actually work together, right? They're not mutually exclusive. And again, you know, I think it took a lot of introspection and connecting with that ancestral rhythm to really understand that all rhythm, you know, works together if, if you just know how to put it together and allow folks to just be themselves. Mark, it's really interesting the way that you're describing how you're bringing together, in fact, two um, sort of cultural, however we want to talk about it, pieces. But you're, and instead of holding them apart, saying that they actually, um, in bringing them together, both contradict each other and also maybe represent something that actually is a kind of active lived um, context. The way you've talked about it, and I, I was really struck by, by the activeness of this metaphor, is that you inject things into culture, right? That you you actually put them back. So you gather them, right? Um, and certainly there's been a lot of discussion around cultural appropriation, what it means to use from different pieces. But it also sounds like you synthesize and then push it back out. Can you talk about that um, that notion of injection? I think it's really interesting. And, it, and to me, there's a politics um, at work there as well, particularly when it pertains to teaching um, performing, but also teaching as well, um, how you inject back into culture in a, in, a, in a really active way. Yeah, I call it the politics of humanity. And it's actually the name of the book that I just yep. wrote and editing and trying to put out there at some point. But the idea is my work really focuses at the macro level on identity, authenticity, and power. And the idea is that once you come into full knowledge of yourself, you can engage the world authentically, which then becomes an expression of power. And not power in the way that we've been taught power. That's more about authority, right? It's um, If you are the president of the United States, whether we voted for you or not, you don't really have power as much as you have authority given to you by the people or the electoral college, depending on how it works, right? Uh, to do things and make decisions on the behalf of the of the nation, right? Uh, mayors, elected officials, they don't have power as much as they have authority. We have power as individuals and our power is amplified as we bring it together um, as an expression of our collective humanity. And what I had to figure out on my own path to my identity is that yes, phenotypically I present as a descendant of Africa, a black man, but if I go back just three generations, there was a rape. And I have German ancestry and I have um, uh, British ancestry uh, in my DNA, which means, yes, I can you know, do what I have done, and that is identify as an African in America, but I should not dis uh, deny that other heritage that is in my genetic makeup, right? Um, it's as much a political identification as it is a spiritual one for me. And that's why I study classical composition because I have that in my, in my genetic makeup too. And the synthesis is in acknowledging and accepting all of that, the fullness of who I am, and then producing an artistic product that um, hopefully creates a shared unity in, in the experience of the work itself. And that again is a metaphor for who we all are. I mean, none of us are purely one thing or another, right? Um, and if you go back far enough in anybody's ancestry, you know, you find the continent of Africa because scientists have already told us that's where we all came from. So this notion of difference is a construct that's false, as false as these constructs of race and class and gender and all these other things, right? And so when you talk about injection, the idea is to synthesize this wholeness of who we are, mm -hmm. create something authentic, and use whatever power I have to bring it to people or, or, or present it to people in a way that they can all find themselves in it, however they engage it. And then, you know, in opportunities like this, you talk about yeah. why that's important and, and, you know, the educational aspect, which hopefully then uh, allows people to think about things that they normally would not or have not had an opportunity to. 
Mark, in some ways, what you're just, I mean, I'm a textile, have a textile hand. That's my first hand. Um, and, and so when I listen to you, I think so much about you're talking about this complex weaving and that we all are made up of all these different threads mm -hmm. and histories that we are conscious of and not conscious of. And part of the injection is making them more conscious. But also, I'm thinking underlying, you know, authenticity and power is trust. Mm -hmm. And we're at a moment in the culture where trust is thin <laughs> in many yep. ways, although today yep. it feels like things are changing uh, and we'll see. <laughs> but um, in, um, can you talk about that? Like you talk the trust of yourself, of your own history, the trust of your ensemble among yourselves, the trust of the audience, the, the belief that comes from trust that really is a counterforce to fear. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, culturally, we, I think, have been socialized against trusting ourselves, right? It, it's really interesting that we talk about American exceptionalism, and yet anyone who's exceptional is often marginalized, <laughs> which is why artists have not been paid well or anything, <laughs> you know, throughout the history of the culture, right? Because we are the exceptional thinkers in a lot of ways, and because we see the world so differently, you know, we're often pushed to the side and some of us break through, most of us don't. And it's because we are the ones who are exceptional. We are the ones who are different. Um, but even in that marginalization, ostracization, the fact that we come to a point, some of us, where we can fully trust ourselves, it's what leads to the work, right? You couldn't create, I couldn't create, Johanna, you couldn't create, administrate all the things that we all do if we didn't trust whatever that voice or that sensibility is inside that leads to the production of something, right? Um, and, and so that's the first step. I mean, even in developing our own identity, we have to trust what we feel and think and hold as who we are, right? And then that second step in trust is really the communal aspect. You attract, you know, that which vibrates or resonates with what you are, right? And you build that community of trust. And when you activate that community, you're activating trust toward what can be change and transformation. You know, so I have to trust the ideas, the sounds that are in my head that most people, if you were in here, would think I'm absolutely nuts, um, <laughs> right? And then I, I have to communicate those ideas in a way that builds trust in the community of musicians that I work with. And then the performance is the activation of that trust, right? And hopefully I've built a reputation as a composer and performer that when people come to see us, they trust that they might hear something they've never heard before, but they're gonna get something out of it. Whether they think it's good or not, that's always rel relative, right? I can't always promise that because we're trying to push, we're trying to experiment, we're trying to do some different things. But the hope is that it brings you in and it, it tosses some ideas out or, or stirs them up in you that helps you think a little differently about something later. And that's the trust that I ask for from my audience, um, that you trust that the ideas that you are presented with may not be things that you love, but will be things that shift a perception or perspective at some point. I'm also thinking about that when we all sit together in an auditorium, which is something none of us are doing right now. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> but I also think that, you know, we're sitting elbow to elbow with um, people we don't know and that you share this experience. And so there's this other kind of thing that happens when something is shared, you know, like you've gone through this together. Mm -hmm. And um, and we just don't have enough of that. I mean, and that's that's. Um, that's show, that's been designed socially, right? That's what segregation, redlining, all of that stuff did. I mean, the fact that we have so many people that believe so many things that just aren't true is, you know, a, a manifestation of that social engineering. You know, um, for instance, I mean, I grew up in an in a area that's poor, mostly African-American but all of the European Americans who grew up in the area had that shared experience. And we see the world similarly because we grew up in a similar environment. It has nothing to do with our ethnic backgrounds. It has everything to do, to your point, with our shared experiences that are, yes, informed 
through the lens of our ethnic background because everybody's homes might have been different, but we still had, when we came outside, those shared experiences. What happens when we really focus on that and cultivating those shared experiences as opposed to what may, you know, on the surface um, make us different? I, I, I hedge because I don't think it actually makes us different. It just makes aspects of our experiences different that enriches you know, if you've experienced something that I have and I learn about it, I'm better for learning, you know, as opposed to, oh, and she's got that and I don't have it. Therefore, I'm less than or better than or what have you. Right. Mm -hmm. That's that's absurd. It's right, that, something that's, that brings us together. Yep. Something that's always been impressive to me about you. And actually, you know, I think it. I, I normally wouldn't talk about my um, relationship with you, but ours is actually really profound to me because I flew in for that January performance before I started at the WEX. And, um, and during that trip, which um, was because I wanted to see, I wanted to see, um, I wanted to see, I wanted to learn who you were. And I wanted, I had heard about your work and I wanted to see it um, live, which I did. You also then were gracious enough to drive me around the next day and give me a tour of Columbus. And something that struck me always um, about that day was you're so, you're incredibly generous and you're always really kind of talking about filling things up. And making things more and but you are also very straightforward in your um you know critiques and your um wanting to pull back and kind of reveal truths and i and i find those two things how they how they work together to be really interesting so on that trip where you were supposed to be convincing me that columbus was a wonderful place and that i should um come and direct the wex you actually did precisely that but by giving me an actual tour of columbus um and I want to talk a little bit about that because that geography informed everything about how I've experienced Columbus since. So I didn't know Columbus. I got in your car. And by the way, the, the ride culminated with Mark forgetting to pick up his youngest daughter and us having to race to get her. So I got to meet her, which was actually a wonderful end. But we're in the middle of a pretty intense conversation about segregation and redlining, mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. and, and about the fact that this wasn't a, I mean, it is a deficit, it, but it also was a reason to come to Columbus to, to do the work, right? You weren't, you didn't drive me just straight into German village. We talked about that. Um, but instead we really actually moved around Columbus in a way that, um, that showed and articulated it as a place that we understand the parameters of on a day like today. Will you just talk about that decision? Like what, and, and again, without making it so much about that day, how you manage to be so generous and generative and, and full. I think about you a lot as, as full and there's a lot of pleasure in the work. There's a lot of joy, um, but also there's, there's a real critical edge. And, and I just wanted to say that something about you I, I particularly appreciate as a person, but also as an artist, is that those two things aren't held apart. They are brought together. Yeah, so there's a griot tradition. Griot is the French word for jolly or, um, you know, troubadour, professional musician in West Africa. Um, and, and there's a sect of that group of musicians called the Domo. And the Domo are, are the group of elders who can only tell the truth. You know, and whether or not they use tact is up to them, but they have to speak truth. And I've gone through a process where I've tried to, you know, be politically correct and say, you know, the things that will advance my career. And it just doesn't feel right. You know, I've been signed to record companies and they've told me I had to do this project or that. And I, I said no, and I got dropped because it didn't feel right. And so if I'm not expressing something authentic, then it literally, I have a visceral physical reaction. So yeah. I could not, you know, in my own self-interest. I couldn't take you to German Village or to Albany and say, hey, this is Columbus and it's great because that's not Columbus, you know? And, and on the other hand, I, I do feel like, and I think we, we talked about it uh, then, that the unique role that a contemporary art center has in a community like Columbus is to push the yeah. conversation forward. Because Cal Columbus, as I like to call it, is the <laughs> biggest small city that you'll find in America. We have so many opportunities here that we don't take advantage of because um, there's a fear or an aversion to progress in a way that may uh, mean or equate to some kind of failure of some sort. You know, we have more 
you know, we have Ohio State. We have more resources than than needed <laughs> to really be a world class city. And you see, folks, this in the last week talking about our AAA credit rating. Like, well, what are we doing with it? Are we investing in the largest school district in the state, which is failing? No, we're not. Mm-hmm. Are, are are we really investing in neighborhoods that were decimated because of the interstates? No, we are not. Are we investing in that corridor 71, 670, where the poverty, the the life expectancy, and all those um, low negative metrics abound? You know, no, we are not because we are a class uh, uh, and and race based society in Columbus. Um, we are separated by class and race, um, and I really do think, and I, I express this to you that that is a reality that also presents opportunities. Right. And, you know, the the traditional museums don't really have that as a focus in terms of not even social justice. I'm just talking about engaging, you know, the today in the way that it is, because a lot of museums are about what happened yesterday. Right. But contemporary art and contemporary art museums are supposed to be um, engaging the now and in, in some cases tomorrow right but you can't really deal with tomorrow unless you understand yesterday and today and i think that is um, an opportunity for the wexner center and you can't do that work you can't curate work that engages the whole city unless you see the whole city right you know and unless you understand the dynamics of the whole city and we do a great job in columbus of only talking about the good things which might be a sliver i'm not going to reject that good stuff but there's a whole lot over here that that needs work, but we're only going to show you the shiny points, and you know there's so much more that makes the city what it is. You know. Well, and it seems like one of the one of your big projects is also what are the conditions for us to be together, right? Because when you have shared experience, that's when things begin to change. Right. And and so what are the forms for helping? to create that right now. Like I have to admit, um, Mark, when I was listening in the last couple of days to some of your work, I had this fantasy <laughs> of a project. And I was like, I want every neighborhood on their front, like sidewalk or porch or whatever, drumming, <laughs> right? And it's like, and speaking and calling across the distance to each other. And I was like, oh, Mark could do that. He could pull that off. That would be amazing. I mean, th- the thing is we don't, really have anything in this city where everyone can feel like they belong in a space right there there is no space like that there's never been an event you know even at the um festivals in the summertime when we had festivals in the summer um you know there were some festivals that were policed more heavily than others because of who the expectation uh was around uh, because of the expectation of who would be at those festivals you know um and, and we have a serious issue <laughs> uh, as it relates to belonging and, and a sense of community. So it would be fantastic to do some kind of, you know, citywide art thing, you know, whether it's performative or, or not, to like say everyone has a voice, everyone has a role, this city is for everyone. And from here on out, you know, we're gonna do that work of ensuring everyone has a voice because that's the only way we become a better city. Well, in these conversations, obviously nationally, right? Like the, they're, the silver lining to what has been an incredibly difficult year is that people can't not have these conversations. The question is whether they move things forward in any real way. And, mm-hmm. you know, something I wanted to talk to you about and you brought up when we, um, when we touched base last time was actually the incredible um, number of talented artists in this city and in lots of cities that somehow kind of go they, they, it's not that they in a funny way even need the institutions, they've gone another way and they found ways to, to collaborate and to produce. But can you talk just a little bit, and I'm starting, I'm learning the fabric of the city, partially due to friends like you and others, you know, I've, I've started really making my way into those pockets. But what's so interesting is that they exist and they flourish, but they aren't visible in the ways you're talking about. Maybe they don't have to be, but, um, but, but I actually would love it if you talked just a little bit about kind of on the ground, um, sort of artist communities. And you you never produce alone. Everything that you make is a collaborative endeavor, um, which I think is really an important part of, of the discussion as well. So 
I don't know, will you just talk about the, the sort of art sphere and your place in it here um, be, beyond um, what, we've, what we've talked about in terms of, of the work? Yeah, um, historically, there has been little to no institutional support for artists of color. So we have always had to find our spaces and create our own spaces, whether it was a little hole in a wall club like Snaps and Taps in the 90s, or um, uh, and that was downtown almost on Washington, almost catty corner from the Columbus Museum of Art. Or um, What was that, Mark? What's Snaps and Taps? Snaps and Taps was this place where um, it was owned by, oh, Todd Tooney and, and his friends. Um, and Wednesday was poetry night. Huh. My band was there on Saturdays. There, wow. And we were doing, we were like the hip hop avant-garde jazz musicians. We were sagging <laughs> pants, you know, oversized shirts, like the hip hop culture that we were, you know, a part of, but right. we were playing avant-garde yeah. improvised music, you know? And so we would only have two or three people in the audience, but they let us be there, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and, and then there was like a reggae band on, on Fridays. There was um, some cool R&B stuff on Sundays. And we would create projects. And they would give us space every month to do these really cool experiments. You know, Scott Woods, the, the uh, acclaimed local writer, and I had a group called Black Air Poets. He would write the poetry. I would write the music. And we would do concerts, you know, a few times a year. And it would be packed. I mean, it would just because it was new it was different the energy was cool and it never ever no matter how much we made no matter how how well we put the thing together it never elevated to the point where you know uh the folks in the traditional arts infrastructure would be supportive or even want to know who we were as artists so we just we did that and then we moved on to the next thing you know new harvest in linden was another hub for a while and now scott has opened Streetlight Guild, and I know you've been there a few times uh, to see what's going on there. And while now in our 40s, <laughs> we, we've attracted some support from, you know, the traditional art infrastructure, there, there is no pathway for a young artist to come up through the ranks and then launch, be launched into the world from Columbus, like if you were in Chicago, even Detroit, uh, Atlanta, LA, New York, obviously, and places like that, um, that we just don't have the infrastructure. And it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what, what your discipline is. Um, you know, I don't know, Anne, are you from Columbus? I am. Mm -hmm. But you, you left for a time. I left. I left for almost 20 years. And, yeah. and you became Anne that you had always been because you weren't here. And then you were able to move back and still be you, right? Yeah. Um, that's how you have to kind of be in this city. You know, because we are where we are, um, I think a lot of innovation happens, you know, in a very organic way. I've been around the world and people have been like, you're from where? Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. LeBron James? I'm like, no, LeBron is two hours north of us, <laughs> you know, um, or, you know, people have even called Columbus a suburb of Cleveland, you know. Uh -huh. um, but because we're isolated artistically in a lot of ways, we, we begin to think about art in a unique way, differently for our peers around the country. And there's some value to that. Yeah. You yeah. know, but as Anne shared her story, you've got to leave, you know, for some time and, and build elsewhere because building here means nothing. I mean, thank, thank, I'm grateful to the Wex for the support of the 400. I mean, it was a $200,000 project and you all helped me get over the hump. Um, but like, if I had released that in New York, in London, in Chicago, um, I'd be, I'd not have a day job, you know? <laughs> Literally, you talk, we went on that tour the next day because I was at work the next day after the premiere. I, I, I didn't get to rest, you know, and, and kind of dream up the next project as a lot of my friends have who are based in Chicago, New York. Um, so there's a lot of great work happening in Columbus that the world won't see because we just don't have the appropriate infrastructure to, you know, tell the world what's going on, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, Mark, because I, I feel like I have some of the same reaction when I travel, you live where? Mm -hmm. But but I want to kind of circle back to this thing about trust, because I also think that there's a part of being here that allows for a kind of spaciousness to actually let 
your work developed, you said earlier, like, oh, you haven't pursued certain things because it didn't feel right. Like, like you have this ethical barometer that's saying this is right for me, but this isn't right for me. And that that's guided the way that the work has developed. And so it's this weird like double bind. So it's like, how do we, um, those of us that do, you know, have the connections or have, you know, worked outside of here, like how do we help cultivate the landscape that helps create that possibility? And I think a lot of your work in education and in the publication that accompanied the epic, um, you know, is, is, a, is a part of of making this other condition. It's not just a condition for the work, it's a condition for uh, people to trust themselves, their own creativity, to learn their history, in a, in, to learn history in a different way. Yeah, that, but that comes from the function of the work, right? So in, in kind of coming to a level of awareness about my own identity as a human being, as, as an artist by extension, you know, I, I learned that African music has always had a function, right? And by extension, African American music has always had a function. It is only uh, through colonialism and, and all of those kind of new ideas <laughs> that we learn this dichotomy of sacred and secular or, you know, art for the sake of art versus functional art. That's not who we were, right? I mean, the making of masks, the, the creation of new music or dance in traditional African societies across the continent is not art in the way that we understand it in the West. It's not art that's separate from some ceremonial uh, ritual or a celebration or something like that. It is part and parcel a function of society, right? And so all throughout my formal education, I was asked, well, when are you gonna let this go? When are you gonna just focus on that? As, as if these things are mutual, mutually exclusive. And I, I rejected that. And in a lot of ways, sealed my fate because I didn't get recommendations uh, to go teach in the academy from the faculty at Ohio State where I now teach. I didn't get you know, placements uh, in um, whatever, you know, uh, as a composer or what have you. My music was never performed um, at OSU just because. Like I had to pay people, um, and, and I offered to pay people over a thousand dollars and still got rejected. You know, I had to fight for every performance. I had to fight for everything, and it took me, you know, a long time from two, uh, from 1997 to 2013 to finish my educational journey because of those challenges, um, and I learned a lot. And so. In, in having struggle in that way, I realized that there were just things I was not willing to do, right? And, and that's just the academic track. I was also out there, I started touring when I was 14, and I saw how big name acts in gospel and jazz and other types of music treated their sidemen or, or were treated by promoters, you know? And I wasn't willing to do that either. And so, you know, from the earliest point, I also became a dad and a husband at 22. So I had responsibilities that my artist friends didn't have. So I always have had a job. And because I had to earn a living for my family, I didn't necessarily have to depend on my artistic income to support the house, which meant I had a lot more flexibility, which gave me the opportunity to experiment, which, you know, it's like when Master Yoda sent um, Obi-Wan to, to watch over uh, Luke, you know, he was kind of stuck, you know what I mean, on Tatooine, there was nowhere to go. So he had some spirit homework to do. And I guess that was the ancestors way of giving me spirit homework and, and create a new way to approach my instrument and composition um, without having to worry about the market forces, you know, directing what I did. So um, I've been able to have a level of freedom while still being bound to your point, um, because I can't get away from Columbus, I need this job. Uh, but I'm doing work that I would hope would allow me to get out of Columbus. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it, it's it's weird that way, but I, I've been able to make decisions because I've had to make other decisions. And my experiences have informed those decisions in a way where I'm not gonna sacrifice anything. I, I had a mentor, I saw him apologize, you know, for, for the CD that he produced. 
Um, and he he apologized because it wasn't his best work. It wasn't his best work because he did what the record company wanted him to do. And I, I vowed, I was 16 or 17 years old, I would never ever apologize for my work, which means I couldn't do an album that I didn't feel like I wanted to do or needed to do, you know? Um, and even with the 400, like I said, the, the WEX investment and support was, was absolutely um, helpful, but I was ready to reject it if I was not able to do what I needed to do. And I rejected a lot of offers, um, significant offers for help um, because it had to be what it was going to be, you know? And I'm fortunate to be in that position, but I'm in that position because I've made decisions that take away from the work as much as they support the work, you know? Well, I think you're bringing up also a good point, and I know Anne has a lot to say about this. Probably we don't have time for the whole conversation, but you know, people think of the art world as this space where experimentation is really valued, and in fact, it, it is. But convention is actually extremely, um, and and I know this from having myself, you know, been on the other side of the coin where I'm trying to provide platforms, but the the sort of um, and it's a, a phrase we both use, um, Mark. The, the sort of deficit thinking creeps in. You yeah. know, everybody wants it to look like a thing that they've seen before, they've heard before, they've experienced before, even under the rubric of the new. And so, I have actually been. Um, I still have my honeymoon period with in Columbus. I think sort of happening now, where some of um, the the freedom that Anna is is, is sort of expressing, I have felt even in the ability um, to oversee what I hope is a, an institution that is shifting and being responsive to, to artists to the degree that it can. It's always hard, they're big, they're, they're these mammoth things that um, that are slower than and less nimble than, than individuals. But I do think some of what you're saying really resonates with me because I think more than ever, the arts are needed, but they also need to do their job, which doesn't look like the thing that people think that they want all the time. Right. And, and that's, that's an interesting proposition for all of us right now is how to continue to be attuned, not to the thing we think is going to be the new thing, but the thing that we don't see coming and that, that dis is disruptive in all the best ways. So it's, it's always really useful to talk to both of you because I'm looking at you both on both sides of my screen and you've been, you know, asked to do things and it doesn't fit the bill of what, what people want it to be or mark your, I know that you you loved in a way getting your PhD, but it was also really hard because you didn't perform to the sort of expectations that that were there. So I don't know. It's interesting. I'm I'm not sure where to go with this question, but I guess I would say, what do we? Where are we now? And and how do we move forward in a way that feels really exciting, both here and and um, sort of collectively and and as individuals? Um, you know, what what have you been doing, Mark, since the 400? <laughs> Um, so uh, two things. One, really quickly, I think the most exciting time for um, improvised black music was the middle of the 20th century up until, you know, the late 70s. And incidentally, that's also the time where black America was most engaged yeah. in the fight for its its human and civil rights. Yeah. Um, what's interesting is that we are now in a similar um, struggle. Right. And I just don't see that reflected in the art of uh, black musicians right now. At Why do you think that is? To say say more about that. Well, so these two things happen. Well, a lot of things happen, but but I'm working on a thing. It'll probably be a book. But here's my theory: um, when we were first brought over from Africa, nobody understood the language of the drum, and we still had that. A tool uh, in our in our belt, and that's how we organized uh, slave revolts and rebellions. Right. right? When somebody figured out that we were actually communicating real words through the various rhythms and pitches of the drum, they took that away, and it it it, it took away a serious form of communication that could. It, it was the first text message before there was a cell phone, right? Um, and then we figured out other ways to do it. And we found subversive ways to organize and rebel through the spirituals and the blues, the field hollers, you know, those early musical inventions. Um, and so black music has always been a form of rebellion. Even right. to sing about love and dance in the context of oppression is revolutionary. Yeah, yeah. Right? But what happened was, as the music that is falsely called jazz evolved from the 30s to the 70s, 
there was a realization, and it wasn't just quote unquote jazz or black art music or however you want to call it. Pop music, soul, gospel, all of this was being more conscious and political between the 40s and the 70s. And then disco hit, right? And disco had been developing in the 60s, early 70s, but it really hit big around 73, 75. And that coincides with the end of the civil rights movement of the 20th century, right? And they stopped teaching music in the politi- in, in the public school system. They stopped uh, supporting or funding, you know, public art in a lot of ways. And so you had a generation of students from the 70s to the 90s that didn't grow up with significant studies in art. And it wasn't just black kids, it was everybody. Yeah. Right, and simultaneously you saw support for the art go down, for arts go down. You saw at the federal level even, I mean, all across the board. There were, I mean, and then by the 2000s, you don't even see this stuff on, you know, weekly cartoon shows and, and, and you know, the only place you can find it on public te- is public television. So it's not in the culture, art in general, is not in the culture the way it used to be. Yeah. Because when people learn to think three, freely through the artistic process, they are not good Americans. Because to be a good American now is to fall lock, stock and barrel in line with a Republican Democratic agenda as opposed to to be the exceptional human being <laughs> that it takes to have a democracy work, right? Democracy is about collective individualism, not collective homogeny, right? Those are two different things. And our culture, artistic culture helps people find themselves and think about things that are outside of the norm, right? So I think a lot of the issue is that the corporatization of art happened, yeah. and now people are paid a lot of money to do dumb shit. Yeah. yeah. And forgive me, but that's just, I don't know how else to put it. You know, I, I quote you. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope, I hope you know we're on the same page there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, that that's my take on that. And, I, and I'm trying to work something formally about that, because I can kind of pinpoint yeah. places in, in American history where there was a transaction. Uh, like in 1988, it was the best year ever for hip hop releases. 10 years later, all of those independent comp- companies, record labels were bought up by the majors and the music shifted almost immediately, right? That That's not happenstance, yeah. right? I, I really do think there's a political um, machination happening to make those things work. And, and so, you know, my work, even since the 400, has been around what we're calling 400 Forward. Um, we were on tour and playing some of the music from the 400 and really talking about the next 400 years. Mm-hmm. Because my research has shown that psychologists say if you've experienced a trauma for X amount of years, yeah. it takes about that many years to yeah. overcome the trauma from the time you start. Yeah, yeah. Right? And maybe to your point earlier, and th- today in January 20th, might be that first step in starting to heal. I hope. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, right? It could be. Um, <laughs> but it's going to take 400 years, several generations, yeah. right, to really exercise the, the sins of racism, genderism, classism, all of those things that are now what really inform and, and undergird the society that we're living in. Um, but of course, all of that was interrupted by COVID. And starting in April, we uh, began to produce a weekly uh, webisode on YouTube called Drumversations. And uh, we did, half of it was me playing solo drum set and the other half was talking about, you know, the relevant issues of the day. Um, issues like trust, power versus authority, all these kinds of things. Yep, yep. Um, I'm working on a cello concerto, a piece for the Cavani string quartet, and a piece inspired by the work of Amina Robinson. That is when I can write a note. I, I've, it's been hard to compose. Yeah. You know, with everything going on, um, it's, it's hard to work. The ideas are there. It's just the energy. You know, it's just so much, so much. You know, if you stop to think about it for too long, I mean, you just want to cry and then just be overwhelmed by all the negative energy that is in the space. But you know, like you know, Mark, as as you occupy this this place and and begin these new projects, I'm really curious um, if uh, where the voice is in terms of like you know the epic was 
there's not a vocalist. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, there's a lot of storytelling going on. And there's a lot of history. It like, do you see um, writing for the voice in a different way? Is that beginning to influence anything you're working on? Um, I think in one and something you actually it was a conversation you had in conjunction with the Wexner project. Um, I think you were talking about the reconstruction project. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the piece for the Cavani string quartet is for string quartet and soprano voice. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I, the reconstruction and idea project is my next big installment um, post 400. It's an oratorio. And I have this great big book of black orators that I'm going to put these folks mm -hmm. in conversation with each other mm -hmm. um, to tell the story of Reconstruction and then the, the mm -hmm. Nader, um, which is the worst time in race uh, relations yeah. post slavery. Right. Um, because even with 12 albums, eight and a half hours of music, you can't tell the whole story, you know. Um, but traditionally, in African music, the drum is a voice. Right. And the reason why I tune the instrument the way I do, so I can play melodies that are recognizable mm -hmm. to you know, non-musical ears, um, to kind of reconnect the drum as a voice, not just in the, in the ensemble, but on its own. And that's why I started the drum versations piece. Um, I released an album, uh, might've been 2017, um, called Drum Versations. Uh, and, and that term, drum versations, drum conversation, is a play on the talking drum, which is an actual instrument of mm -hmm. West Africa. Um, and the idea to the earlier conversation about rhythm is to restore the drum set or the drum as an instrument um, to its position as a member of our community, mm -hmm. right? And to use that as a voice in and of itself. Um, the Literal voice is never far. My mother is a singer. My children sing. I grew up singing in choirs. So I, I tend to write from instruments as if they're voices. Mm -hmm. um, but I have a, a, a uncle who has written over 600 pieces, most of them for voice. I'm never going to do what he did. You know, I mean, it's just I grew up with people who wrote so well for, for a human voice that I needed to create my own space, even in my own familial context. And nobody wrote for instruments. So I, I focused on instrumentation. Um, but a lot of the work I have on deck does now include voice. It's just also harder to work with singers for me um, because a lot of singers aren't musicians. And this is a conversation that I have with my daughter, an argument rather. Um, I don't get the luxury of 10 rehearsals and three performances, right? Uh, even for what we did at the Lincoln, we had two performances, a dress rehearsal, in the concert, yeah. right? And my music's not easy. So when you add other elements, yeah, that's more time rehearsing that you have to take. And I rarely ever have the budget or right. um, am afforded the luxury of time to really make it all happen. So I'm hoping that somebody will give me half a million dollars so I can do this oratorio, because that's what it's gonna cost. Yeah, I see that we are very quickly um, sort of coming to a close, although we could talk to you forever, Mark, and, and it's really an amazing, this was a very, this was an apropos conversation for today and, and really um, thank you. So, uh, you know, just in the vein of what these conversations have been, we've been basically meeting with people that we like and whose practices we really care about and hoping to just have something kind of as a generative document for these days. And this is a, a an extraordinary, um, uh, extraordinary, uh, iteration of that. So uh, thank you. Is there anything else you want to, in the last three minutes that we have that we haven't talked about that you you feel this is a good platform to bring up? Um, well, you know, I, I would just encourage folks to take this time of separation, you know, seriously, not just in terms of masking and social distancing, but in, in the work that we need to do to become better so we can create a better world for all of us. You know, yeah, there's a phrase you use. I can't remember. Oh, you have to be better so you can do better. You can do better. Maybe, maybe that's the one. Yeah. Um, but it, it is true. You know, I, democracy is something that we do. It's not something that happens for us or to us. And if we don't decide to use our own agency to be a better society, then the society will never be better. You know, and hopefully that's 
kind of one of the fundamental messages people get from my music and, and my work in general is that I trust each of us to do what we are supposed to do to make the world a better place. Well, Mark, you, you helped it today and thank you because it was very, it was a moving conversation for me. And yeah. I think Anna and I, this is how we're keeping going. So you're doing us a favor. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. Thank you so much for having me. Always thank good you. to talk to you. Wonderful. Great to see you, Mark. Thank you.